Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf and welcome to my podcast show. Today I have a very, very special guest and dear friend, Dr. Peter Bregan, and we are going to discuss all things psychotropic medication, how to safely withdraw, and alternative medication. So let me first introduce Dr. Bregan, an amazing man, amazing psychiatrist, and a, and a very special friend. Dr. Peter Bregan is a world-renowned Harvard-trained psychiatrist and former consultant at NIMH who has been called the conscience of psychiatry for his many decades of successful efforts to reform the mental health field. His work provides the foundation for modern criticism of psychiatric diagnoses and drugs and leads the way in promoting more caring and effective therapies. His research and educational projects have brought about major changes in the FDA-approved full prescribing information or labels for the dozens of antipsychotic and antidepressant drugs. He continues to educate the public and professions about the tragic psychiatric drugging of America's children. Dr. Bregan has also been invited many times to testify before federal agencies and the U.S. Congress, and he has been an expert on psychiatry, psychiatric drug adverse effects for the Federal Aviation Agency. He has also testified many times at FDA hearings. Peter, welcome. I am so honored, thrilled, and blessed that you have joined me today to talk about such an important topic. Well, Carolyn, you're a breath of fresh air in my life. I have just so enjoyed getting to know you and working with you. And I think that you're doing some of the most important communicating in the world around these issues. So I, I very much appreciate you. Oh, thank you. Well, the, the feeling is so mutual. Peter, you know, you made when you and I were chatting before. You made a statement about the um, just what's happening now with the suicide, increasing suicide rates, and I did a podcast. I mean, everyone's talking about it. Can you can you just say again what you said to me? It was so profound, and I think that would be a really good place place to launch our conversation. Well, we were talking about the uh, spiritual effects of these psychiatric drugs and why we might be having increased suicide rates as we get increased use of the psychiatric drugs, especially the antidepressants. What people don't realize is that uh, there aren't any biochemical imbalances in the brain uh, that are associated with anxiety or depression or any of the human uh, uh, difficulties and suffering that we face. It's a normal brain and it's dealing with unusual circumstances or, or just with life in general. But when you put one of these drugs into your brain, there is always a biochemical imbalance because that's all they can do. And that's how they're studied. We, we, we find a potential drug to sell as a psychiatric drug by finding something that disrupts the biochemical systems in a normal mammal's brain, like a, a rat or a cat or a dog. So what happens when we we disrupt, we uh, disturb, we distress the biochemical functions in the human brain. Well, the first things to be harmed are the highest sensibilities, the highest awarenesses, the, the most uh, delicate, complex aspects of being a human being. And perhaps the most complex, uh, the most... Uh, uh, important, the most refined is uh, is the ability to do unto others as we would have others do unto us, to to love God, to love one another. Even Darwin, who uh, who many many people have gotten a very distorted version of, said the highest human accomplishment was the golden rule. Well, what does it take to to achieve that? You can't do it with a dog brain and you can't do it with a monkey brain and you have a lot of more difficulty doing it it's it's possible but doing it when your brain isn't functioning well whether you uh, have the flu or whether uh, you've had a blow on the head or whether you've had three glasses of wine or, or whether you've smoked marijuana anything that you are doing that is just going to get in there and sort of muck about with with your finest tuning is going to make it harder for you to accept love, to give love, to feel God's love, to love God, to participate in your fullest way uh, as a human being. 
And this is simply not discussed enough or described enough. But it's it's uh, the truth, Carolyn. There's no escaping from it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, you've described that in such a profoundly important way. And I just want to emphasize to the listeners what you've said about the fact that that this messes with your fine tuning, your ability to be deeply spiritual, your ability to be human and reaching out to others, loving others, operating in love. That is, is one of the major effects of these, these psychotropic medications. And you said something else so incredibly important as well. You said everything you say is important. But what you emphasize there about how there isn't an existing biochemical imbalance that's causing someone to, to go through suffering. It is life that causes suffering. And it is those drugs that create the, the biochemical imbalance. And Peter, isn't it so bad that people are not informed as to the dangers of these drugs? Oh, it's a giant fraud that the drug companies in collaboration with my profession of psychiatry have perpetrated. Um, Eli Lilly was probably uh, the starter of some of this great uh, fraud in terms of uh, uh, sending people out even before its drug Prozac was approved. And Prozac was, as you know, of course, but not everybody in your audience will know, was the first of the so-called modern antidepressants. Uh, they're called uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors to try to make them look fancy. But they're just the disruptors of uh, biological functions in the brain. They're, they're, uh, they're part of the whole class of neurotoxins. If you go and read a textbook of neurotoxicity, there can be chapters, if it's a decent textbook, on the psychiatric drugs because they're, they're literally poisoning uh, brain function. Uh, but instead, the drug companies following Eli Lilly did this promotional campaign that, that you may have a biochemical imbalance. And on television, all they can say is you may, because they have no evidence that when they try to say you do have a biochemical imbalance, the F, even the FDA, as poor as it is as a watchdog, wouldn't allow them to make a claim that, the, that human beings have biochemical imbalances when they're having psychological or psychiatric problems. So it was just a, it's just a huge, successful PR campaign. And, it, you know, it reaches to that natural human desire to want to have an easy way out, to, to not have to take complete responsibility, as, as you point out so beautifully in your, your work, you know, that just, just, just being afraid to take full responsibility. I want to interject something. My, Ginger's mother has come to live with us. Uh, uh, I was actually the one to invite her. The son-in-law said, Mom, you're having trouble where you're living. They're not treating you right. We'll come get you. Yeah. I, so she's been with us now for months. And, and she brought her own books. And guess whose book was the first one of mine she picked up? It was a book by a woman named Carolyn Leaf. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> and she read it. She said, you know, my eyesight's not very good. She's 92. She's got things to overcome. So she said, I went through and I, I read the summaries and I read the, I, I looked through it. And, and this woman writes so beautifully. She really communicates warmth and intelligence as she writes. And she's so right, Peter. She's so right. She's a great supporter of mine. Ginger. <laughs> But uh, and, and her being with me uh, and Ginger has just made so clear again the importance of love, of family. G you know, Ginger and Mom are, are uh, Christians, and uh, Ginger's mother has been a very active Christian. She was one of the first board members of one of the national churches uh, in Indiana, and 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 I I see in our. Our life together have the ordinary human conflicts, disappointments, mother-daughter conflicts, general family conflicts, how they just dissolve with love. Because love is the only genuine conflict resolver. Absolutely. And, you know, Peter, that is what you said is the most important thing that any of us can actually hear, that love is the most most important conflict resolver. And, you know, there is that scripture that says perfect love casts out fear. And then it's been scientifically shown as well. So, you know, that, that's, a, that's a fact. And, and Peter, what you were saying about the, the medications, how that whole chemical imbalance has just been, it's been propaganda. It's honestly, you know, that's one of the things I come against the most. And I know it's what you come against whenever, we, whenever I talk about mental health, which is literally all that I means every time I talk, which is very often. I'm finding and bless you, bless you for that, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm always talking to big audiences all over the place nonstop. Folks, listen, so, listen, folks, you have no idea what courage it takes for Carolyn to talk about mental health issues wherever she goes. I mean, I know a very famous Christian minister at a huge radio program and show, and he's, he's retired now. We're still friends. And he actually was disinvited from churches where he went to speak on occasion when he would say, your children don't have biochemical imbalances. That's not why they're misbehaving or not concentrating or not getting along. They need you to figure out what more you can do as a parent, what our schools and churches can do. It's not about the children having biochemical imbalances and needing to be medicated. And he literally, at least on one occasion, he told me, he got disinvited from coming back again. My goodness. You're brave. You're brave. You're honorable. Well, we, we people, I think people are so desperate to know how to get their minds under control, which is very, you know, very much the message I bring. And I think they hear that. But, you know, it's just to be able to have your resources and your expertise. I mean, you have honestly been one of my greatest teachers. And um, I understand what I do about this, about the dangers of psychotropics from your work. And that's why I think it's so important that people realize that this message of the biochemical imbalances is, is, is is a propaganda theory that's got no scientific foundation and the DSM and the labeling and the dangers of these drugs. And the, these are, this is a very real problem that we're facing in, in today's society, Peter, isn't it? Well, it's overwhelming. I mean, estimates now are 20 to 30 percent of the population, you know, over the age of five or 10 is on, is on psychiatric drugs because usually they drop the estimates by including the whole population. And then the horror is that there are tens of thousands of infants on these drugs. So it's it's just a horrific thing that's going on. It's a giant social experiment. Um, we, uh, we've never done anything like this ever to a human population. And listen, listen, uh, people out there who, who, uh, who care about these issues, you're going to be shocked maybe to hear for the first time that while people are staying on these drugs for years and sometimes their entire lives, the studies only last four to six weeks before they go on the market. It's, it's meaningless. The studies that the FDA does to get the drugs approved are meaningless. They're contrived by the drug companies. They're monitored by the drug companies. And the drug companies are the ones who evaluate the data, not the so-called scientists who do the studies. And in fact, the drug companies now are... Uh, by law, can pay the FDA to, uh, to to speed up to speed up the process of getting drug approval. It's a very corrupt system. The approval of a drug by the FDA has become increasingly well. That is really frightening because you know the other day I had a, a very practical example of this in my own life, where a very good friend of mine who has known my teaching for years, who's heard me teach on these concepts and um, basically asked me about a, one of the stimulants, you know, the Vyvanse for helping her child. And um, she was told by her doctors that it's her doctor, pediatrician, that it's safe and it would just help her child concentrate. You know, I nearly passed out in, in my chair when I heard this. I had to control myself and you know, I, was so, I was so shocked and upset because this, young, this is a young, young guy. And you know, this is an issue that so many people are facing. I, I get emails and text messages and direct messages daily about people that are being put on these medications and their lives are changing. Peter, would you mind just for a few moments just talking to the dangers of what they do in, if you, I know it's a huge question, but if you could summarize in a really simple way for people to understand the dangers that these psychotropic drugs, maybe we just define the psychotropic drugs at different tests, different types, antidepressants, et cetera, what they do briefly in the brain, you have an amazing way of explaining that and then just how our brain actually is neuroplastic. So we can, you know, we can heal when we change, when we operate in with alternative ways. But I'd like people just to hear from you the dangers of medications. And then maybe if you could link it to the rising suicide rates in the light of the recent Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain suicides and the increasing 25% increase in suicides and all the, everything that, you know, we've discussed, you and I have discussed in in depth and, and to be so, so concerned about. I know those are huge, big questions. And <laughs> well, I'm I want to see, I know how brilliant you are. Let's see how you handle that. 
I want to see. I I want to. I I I, I want to. I'm going to ask you how many podcasts do you want to do? I mean, you just. I think we could do ten on this. I really do. Well, we're going to Peter, and this is just the first. If you don't mind, we're going to. So this is the first. So maybe what we can do today is just briefly overview. Well, let, let me let me tell you. Let me tell you Go how I'd like it. to start the approach. All right. First, I want to address this very real issue of here is your friend who's been told that there's a safe and effective drug uh, called um, Vyvanse. Uh, by Vyvanse. By Vyvanse. And, and I want to just address that because, folks, this is true. What I'm going to say is true about every single one of the drugs that somebody's trying to sell you or give you. All right. By Vance. If by Vance is safe, then so is amphetamine. Because Vyvanse is amphetamine. It's a trade name for amphetamine. If, if Vyvanse is safe, so is methamphetamine, with which we hear such horrors all the time when it's taken outside the medical context. And in fact, believe it or not, folks, methamphetamine is also FDA approved for the treatment of ADHD, supposed ADHD, but it's so obviously a horrible name that very few doctors will use it, but it's approved by the FDA. Now, cocaine isn't, but if but if Vance is safe, so is cocaine, because they're all pharmacologically almost identical in their effects on the human brain. There's varying intensities, but there's no differences in the neurotransmitter systems. There's no differences in the parts of the brain that they're most affecting. And in fact, when we do follow-ups on children who have taken stimulant drugs and we compare them to children who from the same clinic with the same diagnosis who didn't get the drugs, that is, we do what's called, a, you know, in this case, a very long-term controlled clinical trial, we find that if you give children these amphetamine drugs, they crave them as young adults when they're off of them, and they're more prone to cocaine abuse. And I mean, it's not a mystery because if you give amphetamines, you give Vyvanse or Ritalin, which is uh, almost identical and is always looked at in the same class as amphetamine, Ritalin, by any pharmacology textbook, if, if you give these drugs to mice or rats, they're going to crave the drug. And if you stop the drug, they're going to prefer the drug afterward uh, when, you, when you give them an alternative later to drink water or have food or, or take their amphetamines. The animals will take their amphetamines because their brain's been changed. These drugs profoundly change the brain. And that's why you can get withdrawal reactions from them because they so change the brain that the poor brain, when the drug is stopped, is changed and doesn't know what to do with itself and causes you a lot of disturbance. And I have to put in here, it's so important, don't, don't listen to me or read my books or go, go to my, uh, you know, my videos or any of those things and then stop taking psychiatric drugs because taking them is very, very dangerous. I mean, stopping them is very, very dangerous. So it's dangerous to start. It's dangerous to stop. You, you, if you're going to stop, you should do it slowly with some kind of experience, clinical supervision, which is very hard to find. Um, and the best thing is just not start yourself or your kids on these medications. That's definitely the safest thing to do in all cases. Um, so just looking at this microcosm here, Vyvanse was probably studied for six weeks, maybe eight. I'd have to go check it. Uh, so, so it's an unknown territory after a few weeks. There have been huge studies funded by the government to promote the stimulant drugs by paying these old timers who've been pushing the drugs for 50 years. And they did this giant study and they tailored it to make it work. And they couldn't prove that that stimulants were any better than nothing or, or, or a week at a camp. Because what happens, and this is how it works, and this is basically with variations how all psychoactive drugs work. That is, if you feel better on marijuana, you feel better on, on um, alcohol. This is basically how, how it works. For a few weeks, these drugs, given at their regular doses, will numb the brain. The particular way that the drugs we give the children numb the brain is that it makes them unspontaneous. 
So they it, it crushes spontaneity. And with that fantasy life, creativity and love for mom and being loved by mom and anything they're learning about love of God or most little kids aren't feeling love from God, but, you know, their ability to get there is going to be impaired. So the child sits in the class and is more obedient. The kid sits at home and is more obedient. And the other thing it does, which is unique, is it affects a place called the basal ganglia, and it causes obsession, obsessional behavior, OCD. So the kid's obsessively writing down things, obsessively doing homework, but he's also obsessively listening to videos and obsessively playing games. It causes OCD. And when teachers look at this, they always say the child's better because the child is less problem in class and looks like it's, he's studying, but he's just being OCD. There's no evidence after, after so many years, since the 1950s. I mean, that's a long time ago we've been studying this. There's no evidence that the drug improves anything in our lives other than shutting down behavior for a few weeks until the brain gets angry about it, reacts against it, and, the, and behavior gets worse. Um, and then they tend to land up, sorry, Peter, I didn't mean to interrupt you. And that's when they tend to land up with another diagnosis and potentially an antidepressant or an antipsychotic, or depending on how bad the behavior is. So they land up on polypharmacy very often. Isn't that the case? Yeah, we actually took the words right out of my sorry. mouth. That's right. <laughs> oh, that's good. I was going on and on there. It's good to be interrupted. So what happens then is ex exactly as Carolyn is saying, that Let's say the amphetamine uh, makes stimulates you so you can't sleep. So then you get to give the kid uh, some sort of a sleeping pill. They're all terrible for the brain. Or if the child's mood gets unstable, you call the kid bipolar and you give him God knows what. You give him antipsychotic drugs, mood stabilizers. And now we, and by the way, the other part of it is, is that, uh, which I, what I was about to say, when, when Carolyn in her lovely, lovely voice interrupted, <laughs> was that there's no evidence after all these decades that the drugs improve anything after four weeks. There's, there's no, never any improvement in academic performance. It's just can't, they can't show it. In fact, this huge study that they did, the only thing they proved once again was that the drugs stunt growth. The drugs stunt growth. Do you want to give your children a drug that interferes so badly with the function of growth hormone, not just appetite, growth hormone, that all good studies show a reduction in height and weight? And sure, Johnny may be six feet tall and dad's only 5'10", but Johnny maybe was going to be 6'4". What does it mean? And since it's disrupting growth hormone, it's interfering with all growth everywhere in the body. We just don't know how to measure it. So these are disasters. And then one last word about, about the, the, we're now following up children from the 70s. And I have a summary of this in, in my book, Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. The, the first half of the book is why not to take the drugs and why you should try to come off them safely. And then the second half is about how to do it. So I have a little summary of this in the Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal book and a little summary on my website. But the studies are showing that the follow-up on children who only had mild hyperactivity in school and virtually no problems at home, but were, were fraudulently brought in to studies by the, this government-sponsored studies telling the parents that, you know, it would improve their education, improve their focus and attention, which is, does not do in a healthy or productive way, these people now in their 40s, uh, and uh, probably some of them, uh, some of them are in, they're in pretty much around their 40s, late 40s, they have higher psychiatric hospitalizations than a similar group of children about the same age. Uh, they, um, they have more criminal involvement. They're taking multiple psychiatric drugs. Incidentally, they're not anymore taking the stimulants. So it's not the stimulants that are causing the damage. Now it's that the stimulants were a gateway drug. They did damage early on, but then they were a gateway drug to the people feeling irresponsible, feeling they can't control their lives, which Carolyn so well keeps talking about, takes away the belief that you can control your own mind, these drugs. And so now they're on multiple drugs, multiple psychiatric hospitalizations. Every measure of quality of life is lower, including suicide. 
So these people on a statistically significant basis are doing much more poorly than they would have if they hadn't been put into the psychiatric system. And uh, I mean, they're even more obese and that's, that's from the other drugs they ended up on and also from just being disinhibited by the drugs. So this is a disaster. And, and I'll tell you that, that this drug, I have worse stories worse stories about the antidepressants, which are causing mass murders and, and, and suicide, doubling it, more than doubling it in little tiny clinical trials that last only four to six weeks and that the, and that the drug companies are desperately trying to show uh, are harmless, had turned out when the FDA re-looked at them, had it more than doubling the rate of suicidal behavior and thinking, little short-term studies. And then you've got the antipsychotic drugs, which ruin the brain, and the, the Seroquel and Abilify, and uh, uh, and so on. These drugs, um, they're just um, Risperdal. They're, they're, they're terrible in Vega. They're terrible for the human brain. So, one of the last things, maybe on this, and we should return to this at another time because it's just so much people can take for the first time. I'm really sympathetic with that. Each of these drugs is a neurotoxin, and as a neurotoxin, each of them has a characteristic poisoning profile that's typical of it as a neurotoxin, and not necessarily an overdose. So that some people on the um, stimulant drugs, and and there's evidence of 10% of the kids on these drugs will develop psychotic symptoms because one of the real neurotoxic effects of the stimulants is is psychosis. Then we've got other terrible, and I won't go into any more of them right now, neurotoxic syndromes associated with, with virtually every neurotoxin, including, of course, in some cases, you know, alcohol, and in some cases, uh, marijuana. Let me throw in something about marijuana, because it's not just psych drugs. We're approving marijuana, or it's growing interest in it around the country, because it's, it's so good at dulling your appreciation of what's happening to you in your life. It's, it's so good at numbing you. Marijuana will... Uh, we just, uh, you know, we used to call people deadheads. We forget this. The characteristic expression for people who were doing a lot of dope in the 60s were deadheads. Now, and that means dead spiritually. That's the first death that takes place is the spiritual death. And uh, because this is Carolyn's show, I'm being more articulate about it probably than I have anywhere else. But, I mean, that's, that's the, that is Carolyn. That's the first characteristic is that spiritual death. And also marijuana is is causing a lot of psychoses among young people. Every psychiatrist who sees young people like I do, Mm -hmm. teenagers and young adults, knows this. It's in the scientific literature, the medical literature. Marijuana is producing a lot of psychoses that get confused with schizophrenia. And then instead of just letting the person recover from the marijuana, they end up on all these schizophrenic drugs and then they never recover. Wow, I'm going to take a rest. You talk for a minute. Uh, well, Peter, you just you just a fountain and a wealth of knowledge, and I just want to say to you, thank you for what you're doing. And I want to just tell because there's a few more questions I still want to ask. And, and Peter, you uh, listeners, you're going to see Dr. Dr. Peter Bregan on my TV show. We're going to be doing conferences together. He's actually attending my annual conference this year, and will be one of the speakers there. So you cannot you cannot afford to miss not being there because this man is a leader when it comes to us being aware of how to be human again and how to be aware that we can't, we can't medicalize misery, to quote Joanna Moncrief. Uh, Peter, you talk about a very good term and it's related to what you've been saying. And I thought let's briefly talk about that, then let's briefly talk about suicide and then let's briefly give them people some hope um, in terms of your books and withdrawal, etc. So the first thing is medication spellbinding. You've coined that term. And it's brilliant in explaining, kind of summarizing what you've just been saying about what the drugs do. Yeah, I don't know why no one else ever uh, ev- ever looked at this so closely because everybody knows about it. This is one of those things nobody maybe wanted to look at. Um, and I, I've published, published medical books and articles about it in which I call it uh, something a lot fancier. Um, and the, the, that term is intoxication anosognosia, which means you don't know when or how badly you're intoxicated. I remember uh, 
the all the ads where friends don't let their friends drink and drive. Have you ever tried to stop a friend from drinking and driving? And especially don't try to stop a stranger. I, I was walking near my home one day and we saw uh, in a parking lot in the restaurant and, and my friend who was with me was an attorney, but she was very young and, uh, and very harmless looking. And I'm not very threatening looking. I'm not a real big guy. And we saw this woman who couldn't even get her car keys into her car and they were falling and so on. So we went up to her and I, with emphasis on my, my friend who was with me, who, who was a woman and not very big and very, and very uh, pretty girl. And, um, and she, she, she said, you know, you look like you're really not ready to drive. And before we could get our wits, she turned on us with rage and we were surrounded by two or three other drunken friends who had followed her out of the bar. We Gosh. almost got hurt. We wow. ran for We just backed off and left. So that's, and that's medication spellbinding. She didn't know how drunk she was or didn't care how drunk she was and was ready to go out and kill people on the road because she just lost her front lobes to alcohol. Yeah. And then all her friends came out equally disinhibited but equally potentially dangerous in their own wow. way. Uh, well, all drugs keep from us the knowledge of what they're doing because they harm the highest centers of self-reflection and, uh, and for the lobe. So that people who have been smoking marijuana, they come to me, they say they don't have any effect from it. It's, it just gives them a little peace and relaxation. And I tell them, you won't know what it's doing till you stop, and you won't succeed in psychotherapy to having a richer spiritual, psychological life and a much more active life. Because what I want to do as a psychiatrist is not get you over some made-up disease or get you just over suffering. I want to help you live and love and create and be happier and, more, and definitely more, more, more strong, stronger human being. And, and it's only when they stopped the marijuana that they realized, my God, I wasn't having my feelings and my memory, short-term memory was impaired. So it, you we're always fooled by that. I mean, some men typically, but women too, uh, say the man comes home, he has two drinks of wine, three drinks of wine before going to bed. And actually, it's a way of not dealing with his feelings about work, maybe his feelings about coming home, his feelings about the kids. So n not a lot. Doesn't take a lot of a drug to do that. And psychiatric drugs, because they are tailored to cross the blood brain barrier and tailored to disrupt biochemical functions, because that's the only way they even get FDA approval. They have to show this drug is changing the brain. Well, it's not changing it in a good way. At least that's a part of the FDA approval process. And so if you're on a psychiatric drug, you won't necessarily at all know what its harmful effects on you or you won't care. 40, 50 percent of men or more get sexual dysfunction. Why aren't they all crying out? Partly because they don't know it's the drug and partly because the drug is dulling their caring about themselves and their loved ones. Um, so this is a very serious issue. And um, people in general won't know what they're really like when they are taking on a regular basis a psychoactive substance. That's such, such a fantastic explanation. And, and, you know, Peter, that's what so many people will say to me, will say, say to me in some form, whether it's written or verbal, but they help me cope with that moment. Isn't it okay to help me cope with that moment? And my standard response is always, and I teach this from the stage as well, is that we can't suppress issues. We have to deal with them because taking a drug is going to numb your brain. It's not going to deal with the issue. And then it's going to come back when the medication wears off and you've got to deal with the brain damage and the issue. So now there's double toxicity to deal with. You know, and that's just to get around the society, the, the way that society has been um, in, influenced in this almost propaganda fashion that you have to take the medication to, to cope. And if you don't, it's dangerous. And so that's what I'm trying to change. And I know that's what you're trying to change. And, and we just have to keep plowing on. And fortunately, more and more people are starting to become aware of these dangers. People think that the drugs are like, psychotropic drugs are like insulin. You know, that's that classic example that's used. It's like insulin. You give insulin to diabetics. And it's not even remotely the same. Listeners, I really encourage you to get hold of all of Dr. Peter Bregan's books. Get to his website. We're going to put all the details in the show notes. Peter, Peter, you have an incredible book. I mean, I love every single one of your books. But I just want to give people something practical a little bit practical now, a couple of tips and a bit of guidance, because I know there's a lot of people that ask me about withdrawal, and I always recommend your book. 
uh, that that one that the, the one on with withdrawal. Um, the, this and, and I'm just going to re- re- read a brief description of the book. This book provides a new roadmap for prescribers, therapists, patients, and their families that will enable patients to taper off their drugs and achieve emotional and physical recovery and well-being. At the same time, it, it provides an improved treatment approach for all patients, regardless of whether they are taking psychiatric drugs. And the book I'm talking about, specifically dealing with withdrawal, is Dr. Peter Bregan's book called Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, a guide for prescribers, therapists, patients, and their families. It's absolutely outstanding. Peter, when we posted about your book to our, um, on our social media platform and through our email blast, which reached a huge number of people, We've had some incredible comments back and some of them have been, that book saved my life. That book saved my life. And people saying, I have to get this book. You know, so I know that that's a book that's really filled with practical advice, as is every single one of your books. So what I'd like to do now is just briefly, if you could briefly just share a little bit about, obviously there's no time to teach all about withdrawal. And I would love to have you back again on the show multiple times and on, and on the um, TV show so people can hear more from you because they need to. But is it possible in just a few minutes to sort of talk a little bit about the process of withdrawal, the need and the dangers of withdrawal, and, you know, just some of the main guidelines that go with it, and then we obviously will reference them to your book. Yes, and and also let me uh, just take a minute and tell people some of my resources that are available. Wonderful, please do. Since I'm talking so negatively, in a sense, not negatively, but about negative things, I do write about love and I do write about how to overcome guilt, shame, and anxiety so that we can love other people, love God, be productive. And the book is called Guilt, Shame, and Anxiety. And I I put so much of my wisdom into it, guilt, shame, and anxiety. And um, it's about overcoming those things. And the last third of the book is actually, you know, takes you right up to the issue of uh, of, of becoming more loving, becoming a person who, who is able to love and be creative and take charge of your life. There's a lot of resources um, that you can find on Bregan.com, B-R-E-G-G-I-N.com. And uh, I guess those are the two main things I just I wanted to speak about that I very, I very much want to want people to know that there's I'm also wonderful. have uh, positive information out there. Oh, including a, a little book I love called The Heart of Being Helpful. The heart of being helpful about how do you help people? You're a minister. How do you want to help people instead of sending them to the psychiatrist? Well, the guilt, shame, and anxiety book and the heart of being helpful about the principles of, of withdrawing from psychiatric drugs. The most important one is the one that almost no psychiatrist, and I mean almost no, maybe none that I've ever come across, except like two or three of my friends and people who, you know, been influenced by me, and I may be influenced by them, but I. Real, real working partners, they don't obey the simplest principle, which is don't go any faster than your patient can bear. I mean, they pay no attention to the most important principle. Wow. Don't go any faster than you can bear. So start with one drug and a small piece of it. If you've been on them for a while, you know, if you've been on them for months and if you've been on them for years, absolutely. You, you start with one drug and you figure out, uh, you know, which one seems safer to come off or which one's really more dangerous and you need to come off it. And you take the, take off the smallest amount you can, which you can shave off with the smallest pill or whatever, just to see what it's like. Get some confidence you can do it and then build up from there. So that's the first principle. I don't think that, that you'll get that from 99.9% of your medical doctors because they haven't been taught the simplest principle. The second principle, most important principle, very much dovetails with everything you and I believe, and that is you want to have as much as possible a loving social network around you. So, you know, I'll do therapy for a little bit with some patients before we even start withdrawal because I want to maybe have their parents come in if they're young or have their husband or wife come in and build a loving environment. Because of medication spellbinding, you may not know that the reason you're enraged at your loved one is that you just made your first drug withdrawal. You just took off 5% of it, and then you're in a rage or something. So you have to need some people around you who care enough about you who are, are going to say to you, hey, hey, Jen, hey, Jim, um, you told me that your doctor said that 
that you might not know when you were getting angry during drug withdrawal. And I've never seen you this way. So would you please call him on the phone? And the third thing is a good therapist is, would be really helpful, especially if you don't have a very, as so many people don't, a very close and loving net, network. So I think the first two things, go as slow as you can in the beginning, get a sense of it, and never go faster than you want. And as a therapist or a psychiatrist, you're going to often want to say, wait, do you really want to go that fast? You look pretty jittery to me today. Care and concern for yourself from loved ones, from a professional to help you through this process. That's, that, that's just some of, some of the basic principles. And you've got a lot more in your book. And I want to just honestly stress, Dr. Peter is a, so one of the most compassionate and loving people. Um, it, his book on love, game, that one on shame and guilt, that is outstanding. Um, all his resources, they, we work, we are, honestly, our work is so complimentary. Peter, you've been practicing for over 50 years. And you've never had a suicide in your practice. And you've, you don't, I mean, just, just if you, you've got a, we've literally got about four minutes left. So if you can just, and we haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg, I feel, but I just want people to know that this is, this is one of the most positive, probably the most positive psychiatrist in the world, a leader of psychiatrists in the way that psychiatry should run. You know, Dr. Peter's not scared to share with people about how to actually do this thing properly. And he puts so many skills into his book. He's so generous with his knowledge and so um, so so incredibly filled with wisdom um, that this is, as I said, he's been one of my greatest teachers as well. So, uh, Peter, would you, you you've, I mean, you've been practicing for 50 years. You've been helping people get out of the, that have been caught up in, in the whole um, forced psychiatric world, in institutions and so on. You, you fight for these people. Yes. Um, in psychiatry, there's a tendency to teach people to be objective. Well, if you want to make somebody miserable, sit with them and be objective with them for even two minutes. <laughs> Absolutely. It makes people crazy. The old psychoanalysts who used to sit there with a straight face or say nothing while the patient poured out their heart made people psychotic. They wrote about it. It was called regression in therapy. Exactly. It's just bizarre. So... Um, I mean, if, if you're going to help people, then, you know, you, you need to be caring. You need to be involved. If you're doing it professionally, you need to set limits on your contact outside and even limits on your on touching and your contact during therapy. But be caring. Be there for the human. Absolutely. Human. Be human again. Yes. It's literally being human again. It's almost like we have to teach ourselves to be human again. Well, not teach ourselves, but teach the world out there that the psychiatric world that's in shambles, that people's most basic instinct needs to be met. You know, Peter, I often tell, tell people that you, because people, as soon as someone has some kind of a mind issue, it's, it, it, we've been so conditioned in the last 50 years to think, well, as soon as someone has a mind issue, send them to the psychiatrist, put them on drugs. Instead of saying, well, the one qualification that is needed to help someone is love. You don't need to have the PhD or the doctor's certificate behind you. You need to actually be able to love someone. And just listening, sometimes all that someone needs is to be listened to in love. And to, but you also need knowledge. And there's a scripture in Hosea 4 verse 6 that says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And we need to get knowledge about this. We can't be like ostriches and stick our head in the sand. We need to, we need to get knowledge. And this is what I'm trying to teach. And I know the listeners that you, this is quite a lot of information. It's quite, kind of scary, but you don't have to be fearful because fear in itself can block your ability to actually get set free. You need to realize that what, what Peter and I are trying to do is provide you with materials and information on how you can understand how you function, how brilliant you are, how amazing you are, how love is the primary way that we function as humans, and that we've got to be very, very careful of what we're putting into our bodies and what the world of medicine is telling us that we should put into our bodies. We're not anti-surgery and, and general medicine and things. We are anti the abuse of psychotropic medications, which aren't helping the body. We can't use a biomedical model to heal the mind. The mind needs its own unique model, and that unique model is love. So what we're trying to do is not scare you. We're trying to help you understand that these are, this is very serious. If someone tells you that Vyvanse is okay for your child, it's not okay. If someone tells you an antidepressant is just a happy pill, to help you get through the next couple of weeks. That's not, you've just entered into a toxic cycle. We also want to share with you that there's no ways that, that, you, that you can get, you don't have to get stuck in this situation, that there's help for you, that there is, there, there are, if you can't afford a therapist, you can afford a book, 
you can get to these these principles in Dr. Peter's books. He's got lots of um, videos on on YouTube. He has fantastic information on his website. I have endless as well videos, TV shows, podcasts, all kinds of ways of helping you to understand the dangers of psychotropic medication and that medicalizing your misery or dragging your misery is not the answer that we need to operate back in love and, and help each other and learn how to love again. Peter, we've got literally two minutes yeah. left and I have a million oh, questions going through my head. I want to say, let me say <laughs> Please something. Please do. That, that, that two minutes, because you raised something that's uh, rather remarkable, which you said that I hadn't had any suicides in my practice, which is true, even as a resident and an intern. It is remarkable. Um, but I think I can say, say this more directly on perhaps on your radio show than many others. Um, I believe that that is uh, a gift from God. I, anybody can have suicides. Uh, anybody can, a wonderful mother, a child can, can, can kill themselves. So I don't want to leave anybody with the idea that if you're a wonderful enough therapist or even a parent, that that means your child won't commit suicide or, or attempt. So I think the reason why I've had a relatively small number, zero to this point, I mean, could change tomorrow. I have could change today. I have suicidal patients in my practice at all times. Um, is is the caring because what helps people through suicide of feelings is one 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 caring person and i think another reason i've had some success mm -hmm. is i don't make it worse by giving drugs called antidepressants that are known bizarrely to cause suicide so by not giving drugs exactly. and just doing my best and being available to people i think that that has been very helpful and we know from the scientific literature that that's what really really helps people but i also believe it's just simply a blessing that i have had Maybe God looked down and, and said, that, you know, if, if this if this young man or this man has, has a suicide in this practice, it's going to devastate him. And I've got better things for him to do than sit around devastated. <laughs> Maybe that's the case. But Peter, you have certainly done something. Then that is you've operated in a very loving mode from the early stories of where you started in going into those institutions where you couldn't handle the way people were being treated. I mean, your, your background and your stories are incredible. And I'm going to tempt the listeners with with this is going to happen the next time Dr. Peter comes on and next time you see him on my TV show, you will hear a lot more about where, why, why Dr. Peter has this incredible attitude and why he runs his practice in this way and how he helps so many people. And I encourage you once again, listeners, to go to, get, go to his website, go to get his books. You can get so much help and support from both our websites. We're here to love and help you in the best way that we possibly can. Peter, I just want to honor you. You're one of the most outstanding people that I have ever, ever had the pleasure of getting to know in the work that you're doing and how many people you're helping and your bravery to stand out there and, and say what you say and do what you do and write what you write is, is exceptional. I mean, there's so many more things and I know I've already thought of 20 more things and if I mention them, we're going to go on for another five hours. But I'm going to, as I said, tempt the listeners. Dr. Peter, will you please come back again? And share more of your incredible wisdom to. with us. And my last name again, Bregan, B-R-E-G-G-I-N. I'd love to have you visit my website. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Peter Bregan, for joining us today. You've been outstanding, incredible. Thank you, listeners, for listening in. And I pray that you are going to be filled with wisdom and, and strength to and, and operate in love to move forward into the next steps in your lives as you go through this a potential understanding of, of psychiatric drugs and withdrawal and if, you, if it's yourself that's in, involved in this or if it's a loved one well hopefully today is going to help you make massive wonderful changes in your life and remember we're there to help you Dr. Peter Bregan Dr. Caroline Leaf this is the Dr. Caroline Leaf show thank you for joining me today thank you